Welcome to the RE Podcast, the first dedicated RE podcast for students and teachers. My name is Louisa Jane Smith, and this is the RE Podcast, the podcast for those of you who think RE is boring, which it is, and I'll prove it to you. Today, I am honoured and delighted to welcome the Reverend Azaria France Williams to the show, author of Ghost Ship Institutional Racism and the Church of England. Father Azariah, welcome to the RE Podcast. It's great to be with you, Louisa. Thank you for having me. Can you start by just telling us a little bit more about who you are? Um, Yes, so I am, you said, Azariah France Williams, and I am based in Manchester. I am a a fan of graphic novels. Um, I do love a bit of the MCU. I, uh, let me think... RE was one of the only things I was good at when I was at school because I went to church so much. I'd learned a lot of it. I'd sort of picked a lot of it up by osmosis and I loved English. So RE was one of the things that I, when I went into the class, I felt confident, whereas other things I'd felt less confident. But RE, I I was there for that. Mm. I was down with that. (laughs) Absolutely. Now, this is not what the program is about, but I do have to ask you. So in the MCU... Which character do you think is the most messianic? So this is a a podcast episode I've actually done where we looked at messianic figures in the MCU. Which character is it for you? Well, that's that's amazing, isn't it? So different characters come to mind. There's a number who think of themselves in messianic terms. Mm -hmm. So whether it's your Tony Stark, Iron Man, you know, who feels that he wants to put this shield of armor around the world, around the galaxy, this this sense here. Um, you've also got characters like the Watcher mm-hmm. that, that have this incredible knowledge of what's going on, although they're sort of banned by their own vow to not get involved. Although the recent Marvel series, What If, there are some uh, you know questions around that. So I think those two characters come to mind. And then if you're looking at some of the other characters, Wanda Maximoff, a.k.a. Scarlet Witch, mm. um, if you watch WandaVision, yeah. she tries to create this perfect world. Now, you know, for her, there's some grief and a loss of love. However, I, th- I think that there's a the potential there that she's creating a community. Unfortunately, she's the one who's kind of the puppet master, so yes. there isn't the same level of freedom. But I, I, I like the ambition. It could have gone a step further to create this kind of counterculture. But then um, MCU, not strictly, you've kind of got the X-Men situation where um, you've got Professor X and Magneto. Both of them are trying to do something messianic. One of them is trying to get people to integrate, sort of Martin Luther King-esque. And Magneto is more the sort of Marcus Garvey, let's all go back and Mm. find our own space or or more kind of Malcolm X, you know, we need it's more of a revolutionary push. Um, so you've got to fight a war before you get to peace. So I think those characters probably in the mix as well. I think quite a lot of them have got some of that going on. Captain America for definite. Yeah. You know, he's kind of got the longevity. So been through the generations, reanimated and necessary, <sighs> something ancient needed for the contemporary scene, contemporary world. Okay. And also begins to just question, you know, there's some sort of old time values, which the world is in. Interesting. And actually, interestingly, in the episode that I did on Messiah figures in the MCU, it was Captain America that we sort of agreed on. So yeah, be interesting. So little shout out to Giles Goff, be interested to know in your reaction and obviously all listeners. Uh, what do you think of Father Azaria's answer there? Now, the reason that I have got you onto the podcast is because of your book, Ghost Ship, that looks at racial inequality in the Church of England. What was it that prompted you to write this book? Was there a pivotal moment or was it a sort of gradual process? So there was um, a bit of both, really. I spent time with black and brown clergy, ministers in the church, and I listened to their stories. And about 10 years ago, I was doing some research and I went and met a number of black leaders who were Anglicans, Baptists and Methodists who were working in predominantly white areas and had predominantly white congregations. Because I was curious what their experience was, because when it's the other way around, there's an expectation that if you have a white leader, 
with black and brown folks in their congregation. They'll be well respected and honored and listened to, and people will follow their lead. Mm. But then when it's the other way around, I was curious as to what might happen. What challenges did they find they had? What opportunities were offered to them? And so that, I guess, was the beginning of the journey. That was when I was training to become right. a, a Church of England minister, a priest with the church. Yeah. And then I had 10 years of living as a Church of England clergy person myself. Yeah. And I discovered that I was experiencing the same challenges and the same opportunities that the people that I had researched had. And what was more, when I spoke to my black and brown fellow clergy, they were also going through a number of difficult things. And they were mainly suffering in silence. Not because they didn't feel, you know, that they could speak, but the fact is when they did speak, they weren't heard, they weren't listened to. And if they were heard and listened to, nothing happened. There was no action that was taken when they shared, whether it was microaggressions, whether it was the fact that they felt often that they were part of the presentation of a thing. So they'd end up on a poster or in a, a leaflet for something that they had no part in, in, in putting it together. I remember someone. A white clergy friend of mine got in touch and said, we've just done a great resource on mental health. We realize we haven't spoken to any black people about it. And we really would love to sell it into the black majority churches. Could you endorse it for us? And hopefully that will help us to to sell it into the black majority churches. You know, it's interesting to feel used in those sorts of ways. And there's a range of other things that they had gone through. And after a while, I thought, you know, enough's enough. And beyond this, I began to learn the stories of people who, not for the last four or five years, but the last 40 years, have been lobbying the government of the Church of England, which is the General Synod, which is a smaller mirror of our parliament. They've been lobbying the General Synod for change and asking for racial justice. And time and time again, it seemed that we were getting somewhere And then things would undo, unravel. Synod would say yes to some fundamental change. In particular, there was a time back in 1985 when it was agreed that there should be a commission for racial justice. And this organization would be given the power, the agency, the autonomy and the authority to get some good things done and to shift some things. However, that was quickly downgraded from a commission to being a committee where the group of people who were all ready and raring to go to see racial inequality challenged within society, but within the church as well, all of their sense of power and ability to affect change was taken away. In effect, they became a sounding board. They became a bit of a think tank, really, where anything that they came up with, and they came up with a number of reports, In fact, over the years, over 161 recommendations, hardly any which were taken seriously. They were a think tank that weren't actually able to do anything. So I think all of those things combined made me think, I need to write this book. So it's interesting because you've given a real picture of what racial inequality looks like in the church, which is that black and brown people are unrepresented. They are used as sort of poster people for rhetoric that actually doesn't lead to action. They're not listened to. That's what this racial inequality looks like and that people can say the right thing, but no action. And I want to come back to what the church can actually do. But what does racial equality look like? How would we recognise that the changes that are made are being effective? I can think of uh, a couple of different examples. So one of them isn't within the Church of England. It was um, before being a Church of England priest, I was a minister within the Pentecostal Church. And the Pentecostal Church started at the beginning of the 20th century, 1906. There's a place called Azusa Street in Los Angeles in America. And there was an African-American man who had been the son of slaves called William Seymour. Because of the Jim Crow laws, the segregation laws in America at the time, he wasn't able to study theology, that is understanding and learning about who God was. He wasn't able to study with the white cohort. Mm. So he used to sit outside of the theological college and hopefully if they left the window open, he'd pick some things up. However, he was able to get enough to head off to Los Angeles and set up a church. And this church it really was countercultural because 
instead of meeting in rows, they met in a circle. So they were in the round so everyone could see one another. There was no stage or pulpit where anyone was above anybody else. It was a real mixture of black and white people working and collaborating together without the unhelpful power dynamics. Women were allowed to preach in this setting and they were not allowed to hold leadership positions in other churches at this time. And so it was really a radical re of what things could be and what things could look like. Unfortunately and sadly, after time, other white church leaders in power just didn't like what was going on and put pressure on it. And eventually it collapsed in on itself and it wasn't able to sustain this countercultural action and push within the world. So that's one example that comes to mind. Mm. Another example that comes to mind is if we look at the church when it was beginning, as referenced, say, in the New Testament, the book of Acts, which comes after the mini biographies of the life of Christ from different perspectives known as the Gospels. In the book of Acts, we learn about the expansion of Christianity and how the church begins to grow. But that word church is from a Greek word, ecclesia. Mm. And the ecclesia, what it originally meant was men that were 18 or over. And these were the men of Greece as assembly of citizens. And these were the ones that would set the terms and conditions for everyone else living in that area. So Greek men of high standing who were citizens who were over 18. And that was it. That was the demographic. When the early Christians took the term ecclesia, church, they changed what the term meant. And for them, ecclesia, this gathering of people, wasn't for the elite males of society, but this was for everybody. This was for women. This was for those who were slaves, those who were runaway slaves. This was for the merchants. This was for the children. And so they took a word that meant one slice of society, the elite high status slice of society, and said that actually this is for everybody. So this was a very radical move. Mm. And it was expressed very clearly in the bread and wine meal that we might call the sacrament, we might call the Eucharist, which means thanksgiving. And there's this lovely sense of thanksgiving for being able to be one with the other, even though society would say that these people shouldn't be mixing with these people. It was a really incredible time. You had people who were very high up in the military giving up their status and standing to stand alongside Christians of low status who were being persecuted. It was quite an incredible time. So there are a couple of examples of equality that I can draw on. And how do we then get from the early church that was multicultural with a community of equality to the sort of institutional racism that we have today? What changed? Well, <laughs> it's funny, in a way, the, it feels like the original meaning of ecclesia, which was the high status males within a culture and society making the rules to everybody else, it feels like in some way we've drifted back to that. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and so what has changed, there's uh, excellent people want to look into this in more detail and depth beyond Goship, of course. <laughs> <laughs> There's a great book by a guy called Willie James Jennings, mm. and he is an African-American theologian who really looks at the expansion of the missionary endeavor, which back in the 18 and 1900s was very much connected to empire. So the spreading of Christianity was connected into the merchants wanting to expand. So in India, for example, the East India Company, yeah. the British Empire had really done quite a lot to bring an end to the Indian industry of, of fabric making in order to then put their own factories in there and get those materials themselves. Almost like I've heard that recently Amazon have started setting up actual bookshops. So the high street's been depopulated and now Amazon are now coming in. So the British Empire did the same kind of thing, really. It's a kind of an empire thing. You get rid of the competition and then you, you set it up and make sure that you get the benefits and the populations there get very little of those benefits. Mm. And so Christianity became really fused with this sense of commercial for profit institution. It also got fused with military push as well. 
and so I think there's something of that fusion of the military with the merchant, with the missionary, those three M's coming together in a way which meant that actually the power dynamics were always going to be in favor of those coming in. Yeah. And instead of sharing Christ, they were bringing a great level of violence and disruption to these areas and to these arenas. So I think that is partly what's at play when we see the inequalities today, which are exhibited within a number of our churches. Mm. So do you think Christianity then needs to be decolonized? You know, do we need to stop seeing the Bible through a white lens? Do we need to reestablish the brown skin of Jesus and reestablish that in order to differentiate Christianity from its colonial past? I would fully agree with you, Louisa, yeah. on that. Yeah, okay. I'd say yes, indeed. Yeah. And how, you know, because obviously if you look at the Bible, it says things like there is no Jew, there is no Gentile, there is no male, there is no female, we're all one in Christ. If that's what the Bible says, because obviously Christianity has been used to justify slavery in the past. How have people done that? How have people looked at the Bible and from that been able to justify slavery? So I think if we think of that period of time where the missionary, the merchant and the, the military were all working together, things that were produced had a particular lens, a particular colour to them. So, for example, so much of the art, so the church that I'm part of, we have some beautiful artwork which has a blonde, blue-eyed Jesus mm -hmm. and has blonde, very pale angels. The Bible that I grew up reading, and you can still buy it today, a Hamlin's Children's Bible in colour, all the way through, the angels are all white and blonde. Jesus looked like a surfer or something. Mm -hmm. Beautiful blonde hair, salon fresh hair. It was really hench, a six pack as is there uh, being baptized. And so the images that I was reading were a counter narrative to the words I was reading. Because the words I was reading were about love and liberation, were about a brand new society of people collaborating and working together with a common cause for common good. But as I read through the Bible, all the images were saying that the whiter and the lighter you are, the more powerful you are, the higher status you have. And what's more, all of the black characters in my Bible, pretty much there's one which was one of the kings from the Christmas story. Yeah. One of the three kings. And he was kind of okay because he came from outside. So he was an outsider. So you could welcome him. And besides, he was minted. He had mm. lots of wealth about him. So he was kind of all right. He was always going to be the guest. He wasn't going to set terms and conditions. He was just coming in. Another image within my children's Bible was that of a servant mm. or a slave. So you have at the front of the image, you have Jesus and his feet are being washed by Mary. You have the white disciples, and then in the back corner of the image, you have this black slave yeah. holding a tray. Yeah. And then also the evil one, Satan in this Bible, is also depicted as brown with horns. Yeah. And so that was the sort of thing that I was receiving. That was the encoding that was happening without me even realizing what was going on. Yeah. So there's, you know, art and representation and there is a, in terms of things like apartheid in South Africa, there's in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, there are a series of stories and poems looking at the beginning of civilization. And one of those stories, when I come to the Bible, Louisa, what I tend to think is, I don't ask myself, is this story true? I say, what's the truth in this story? Yeah. And that helps me to be able to really get into what might be going on. And there's a character called Noah. And Noah has three sons. And within the story, one of his sons laughs at him and Noah feels a bit embarrassed. And Noah curses this son and says that his descendants are going to be cursed and they will always be servants of the others. Besides the fact that it's quite problematic because white supremacists took that passage to say that actually those that were cursed were those that were descended from Africa. And so they will always be those who are in service of white people. Mm. And so that was a way that the Bible was misunderstood and misinterpreted in order to keep a particular group of people down. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Really fascinating. 
And I think so actually what you're saying is a very simple thing that we could do. And I'm talking, you know, to RE teachers in our classrooms, as well as churches around the United Kingdom, is just be mindful of the pictures that you have and what the sort of subtext is. You know, that actually what colour are these people? And is it historical, in which case they're usually brown? Or if there's symbolic colour, then actually use that in a wise way, in a mindful way. It's a very simple thing we can do. And actually then to re-look at those stories and have a look at the way they've been interpreted and what has motivated that interpretation. I mean, the church in the past has tried to tackle this problem. As you said, this has been a conversation that's been having over decades. Why hasn't it worked so far? Well, that is the big question, isn't it? I think in ghost ship, one of the things I look at is tokenism. So I just look at the fact that yeah. if you don't have the numbers, you're never really going to be able to affect change. But the system works against you having the numbers. So there's been a series of interventions where within Synod, there's been a push to have more black and brown people represented in order to represent a wider perspective, which is good for white people too to know really what's going on across a spectrum of society, not just the part of society that they're from. Mm. But every time it's been sabotaged, it's just not happened. It just hasn't got the vote. So it got the vote in one synod and then a couple of synods later, someone pushes back against it. And so partly there's just a numbers thing of the system will always veer towards the status quo. It will always veer toward the default, which, you know, you can find that in a number of institutions. So perhaps one of the reasons that we have women bishops now, and perhaps one day we'll have a woman archbishop, Mm. is that there are increasing numbers. And there was coalitions of women who had different theological perspectives, but there was a real diverse, powerful coalition working together, chipping away, pushing in order to get things done. So that's one thing. We don't have the numbers. Another thing is what I look at in Goship, I look at the cross and the crown. And the institutional church being the national church, there is built within that a sense in which it's difficult to challenge because, you know, a few years ago, there was a study that said 42% of our bishops were Oxbridge. I can't quite remember the percentage now of how many are privately educated. But if we think of all of our institutions, whether it's the monarchy, the military, the church, that particular cohort... People talk about the old boys club. Yeah. A number of our bishops are part of that old boys club. And so someone said to me the other day, in your preaching, you talk about politics. And why is that? Because I said other clergy that they know don't talk about politics. And I said, well, it's to say, well, if the politics is in your faith, <laughs> you're not going to talk about politics yeah. because it, it works for you. But if the politics are not in your favor or not in the favor of those that you represent, you do need to talk about politics, which are unfairly working against those who you want to see flourish. Mm. So I think, yeah, the numbers, I think the fact that we are the national church to some degree, instead of being the conscience of the nation, sometimes we're just hand in glove with what's going on. Yeah. So do you feel there needs to be a top down change or a bottom up? So, you know, I'm thinking as an educator, I teach sociology as well as RE and we look at these cage factors. So class, age, gender and ethnicity and how that impacts your chances in life and your ability to create status and have power. So do we need to change the bottom and actually have a look at the way we're teaching, decolonize it, empower people, you know, black and brown people so that actually they get represented at the top and then the top changes? Or do we need to campaign and fight against those in power and ask those to represent everybody? Well, I think it's going to be a whole mixture of all of that, really. Yeah, yeah. But I don't, what I'm reluctant to do now is to just wait um, for something to yeah, happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it's not in the interest of those who are comfortably within their status, within their, their societal network, to shift things or to change things, really. People only really move when it's in their self-interest to do so, yeah. I find. So I think what I often ask for is for black and brown people to develop a sense of agency, a sense of autonomy, and to begin to recognize the assets that they have Mm. and, you know, welcome allies around, not to come and direct the action, but to be part of the part of the play and to do their work. And often what I find are the best kind of allies are those who have done their own work and not looking to the black and brown friends to do the work for them that have done their own reading. and. Something that I think white allies can do is to go to their own networks, their white networks, their family groups, 
go down the pub or whatever it is and just begin to ask questions. You know, what do you think about Black Lives Matter? Mm. You know, what do you think about things like white privilege? And have that feedback from other white folks, because that will be really instructive in figuring out where people are at. And it will take a bit of courage from you as a white person. And it will also help you to understand what black and brown people are facing day in, day out. Yeah. But I think that's useful. Mm -hmm. In terms of the hierarchy, as it were, things that I ask people to think about head, heart and hands. So firstly, when I share my stories and experiences, very often people begin to rationalize my experience through their lens. Yeah. They'll say, oh, it's not that big an issue. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not a problem really, is it? Or, you know, you've been oversensitive or what have you. And so I ask people first, can we get out of our own heads? our own model of the world and recognize that it's not everybody's experience or worldview. So to get out of our heads to begin with and allow that story to actually penetrate, absorb it mm. and take it at face value. But if your friend is distressed because in the staff room, so-and-so said something and it's really, it's led to some level of trauma or triggering for them, take that seriously. Yeah. Don't try and rationalize it down because if you do that, you're no longer a safe person for them yeah. because they'll just have to suffer in silence because they've not been heard. Yeah. So get out of your head. Second thing is get into your heart. And by that, I mean, how often do we have people who are different to us, not just in public spaces, but in our personal spaces? So, you know, that we can share a meal with or go and do some activity together with, whether it's going to the movies or something, or going on a walk, bringing people into our personal spaces. So actually, we get to share stories, not from the perspective of, I'm a big, powerful person who's going to pity you, but actually we're sharing stories as empathy. We're trading vulnerability as well as strength. Mm. And then the third thing is your hands. There's a theologian called Walter Brueggemann. And I like one thing that he says, which is, we only really are committed to an issue if we put our bodies there. So yeah, we can give money to charity, but actually to put your body there, to actually go along. Yes, you can give money to a charity that looks after those at Christmas, but what about on Christmas Day actually going and helping to serve a meal, mm -hmm. you know, or being involved in something or collecting for something? Actually putting your body in a place demonstrates a real commitment and a real attachment to that particular cause or issue yeah. and so get out of your head get into your heart and use your hands mm -hmm. you know and hold the hand of somebody else in expression of support and solidarity oh that's helpful and very wise and just as i was researching this i remember reading something which the phrase like jumped out on me which was death by a thousand paper cuts which is that each individual experience that a black or brown person has in itself is not significant but actually they build up over time. So every time they're asked, you know, where did you come from originally? You know, it just sort of undermines them. And actually this is, you know, we're recording this in Black History Month and I'm really conscious of the history that we say and the history that we leave out. You know, we leave out the history of powerful black and brown people from the past when there were kings and queens and warriors and, you know, and actually it just reinforces that story of, you know, not that we should ignore slavery, not we should ignore that colonial past, but that's not the full history. <laughs> You know, and I think, yeah, that's really, really wise. If you could wake up tomorrow and one thing was different, what would that thing be? Well, actually, what you just said in terms of, I think in terms of having a fuller history. Yeah. So I remember one of my, a couple of moments that really um, will stick with me. One was um, a black friend of mine with a, another couple of friends, when the Black Panther film was coming out, they decided to block by seats in the cinema in South London, in Peckham. I used to live in London. And then in the hope that people would buy the tickets. And so I went along and the whole cinema was full of black and brown people to watch the film Black Panther. Mm. And it was just this amazing sense of having a hero representing us yeah. so well so powerfully with such dignity and courage and it was amazing it was just that feeling was incredible and then for me that feeling was echoed where I was living and working in a church in the suburbs of London where of a census of about 10,000 people there are only 98 black people in the census um, it was really really white the white affluent 
part of London yeah. in the borough of Richmond. And I remember seeing this little white lad wearing a Black Panther costume. And it really <laughs> struck me because as a black kid growing up, I would wear Spider-Man yes. costumes or Superman costumes, but all of my heroes were white. And so to see a white person wearing a, a black character was just incredible, yeah. you know? And so I, I just think that the world will be different when we're able to celebrate the heroes and recognize that different histories and different heritages have got so much to offer us. Yeah. For me, then we're getting back to what the true meaning of church is, ecclesia. This community of people, this new society, a world within a world, demonstrating to the world what it could truly, deeply be. Absolutely. What a wonderful way to end. And is there any just final thoughts you'd like to leave our listeners with? Well, I would say keep on thinking and learning. And it's brilliant that we can have this conversation. If people want to hear more conversations that I'm having, there's a podcast that I'm involved in yes. called Grace Podcast, but the G has got brackets around it yeah, because it originally meant God and race. So we're thinking about God and we're thinking about race. And so there's some conversations there, pretty clean. So I think, you know, if you're a teenager listening to this or a child, you'd be able to listen to them um, without worrying that you're going to you know, make anybody blush. Yeah. Although if you're black or brown, it's harder to blush anyway. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. But I think, <laughs> so I think, yeah, you can check that out. But, yes. Um, it's just been a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here with you today and, oh. um, you know, keep on doing what you're doing. Thank uh, it's you. Brilliant and it's really necessary. Thank you so much. Father Azariah, thank you. It's been wonderful. Thank you for giving us your time and insight today. We'll put a link to your Grace podcast and to your book in the show notes so people can check those out. I literally discovered your podcast about five minutes before having this conversation. So there's six episodes I need <laughs> to catch up on. So that, that'll be what I'll be enjoying this week. So thank you so much. My name is Louisa Jane Smith and this has been the RE Podcast, the podcast for those of you who think RE is boring, which it is, and we just proved it to you. But thank you so much for letting us bore the life out of you. 